Hey everybody and welcome back to another episode of Field Facts with Forrest. I'm your host Forrest Carpenter and today we've got a question coming from Brian Smith in Alberta. His question is about hunting greater and lesser Canada's in the same field. He's asking, uh, with a mix of birds coming in, what advice would you give for a decoy setup as you think about silos and socks and spacing? Well, that's a great question, Brian. We're gonna get, uh, we're gonna cover that and a couple other things here um, today on, on this episode, and uh, we'll see if we can help you out a little bit. So we'll start off with the spreads. When you think about having greater and lesser Canada's in the same area, obviously you're dealing with two very different geese, as we lined out in that hour-long episode that I put out, I think it was the second one that came out, man, there are some really big differences and they're very picky. They, you know, they've got their, their own preferences and, and you really got to make sure that, that you kind of cater to both of them in this circumstance, which can be kind of tough. So this is a great question. Um, one of the things that I like to do, uh, typically when I'm doing something like this and, and a lot of the stuff I do here in Colorado is out of pit blind. So it, it makes it really easy to hide in the spread. But when I'm in the spread with something like this, uh, my hide is typically where my lesser setup is going to be. So when you've got this set up, I like to have a big mob of decoys somewhere, like a big group of lessers, you know, five to 10 dozen worth at least, uh, maybe even 15 or 20 to have your big cluster of lessers like that big feeding mass that you'll see. From there, uh, I'll branch off family groups and create those alleys that we talked about when it comes to hunting big geese. Because again, big geese uh, don't really love flying right over the decoys. They like to fly through these alleys and they're not looking for landing holes like a lesser would between decoys. They're looking for big old parking lots of open space where they can sit down and not have to fight any other geese for territory or food. So um, keep that in mind. We're gonna start with a big old mob and then we're gonna run family groups of, of pairs all the way up to groups of 10 or 12. Uh, and we're gonna spread those out, maybe build the shape of your spread with those, whether it's gonna be you know your, your J-shaped spread or your V uh, or, or anything like that. You're gonna build the spread shape with those groups, spread them out, throw a couple random decoys to kind of break up the outlook or the, the outline of your spread. Uh, and, and then that way you'll have a, a nice natural looking spread that's loose, that's big, that covers some ground, uh, but also has your, your tight uh, lesser hole there that not only shows up for visibility, but also will pull those lessers in right to you. Um, when you think about where you want the big geese to land, you kind of have to think about this spread from both aspects. The lessers are gonna work up a leg, they're gonna come right to the hole and, and set right on the edge of that darkest group of decoys. Those honkers, they're gonna try to stay away from those. About 10, 15 yards typically, they'll land on the outside edge. So when you're setting your spread, typically, you know, if your blinds are laid across one direction, I like to have my, my lesser mob kind of wide along the blinds so I don't have too much room in front of me or behind me where those big geese are gonna circle and, and stay away from that big group. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, you know, I really like to have a really loose upwind side of the spread uh, and with a big alley and a big space between my heads uh, or my head or, or all the hunters heads and the decoys uh, behind that lesser mob. So I'd like a nice big alley there. So hopefully the big geese come up and if they don't work just perfectly right into that big wad, hopefully they circle right behind us, right on top of us. In the case of a pit blind, it works out really well, but even in layouts, uh, especially if you've got a good wind, a lot of times they'll get blown downwind kind of right over the top of you as they're making that big pass, that big circle right over the top. So keep that in mind. That's a great way to take advantage of a shot. <laughs> Something I haven't <laughs> talked about a whole lot on here. I did briefly cover shot calling in the lessers versus graders episode, but I haven't really talked about um, you know letting birds finish versus shooting them overhead. Uh, personally, I love working birds all the way to the ground. You get their feet down, it's awesome, and that's when you know you've won. But at the same time, I'm going to take a 15 or 20 yard straight overhead belly scrape shot 
over a 30 or 40 yard goose landing on the edge of the decoy shot any day. You're gonna have much higher success rates, a higher mortality rate as opposed to crippling geese and uh, you know having the dog have to chase them or having to uh, go out in there and chase them yourself. So keep that in mind too. Uh, you may not always be setting up for the finishing shot. You might be setting yourself up uh, on the downwind side of the decoys or on the edge of the decoys where you're actually uh, hoping that those birds swing right over the top of you and you get that nice exposed uh, belly shot or that, that over the head shot there. Um, next thing I want to talk about, uh, he asked about socks. So this is a great question here. When it comes to socks, when you're hunting both graders and lessers, personally, I don't use that many socks. Unless I'm using them to hide in, uh, I like to avoid using socks anytime I'm hunting big geese. Not that they don't work, but it's just personal preference. I've had better luck over sil silhouettes, excuse me, uh, when hunting graders because they're, they give enough motion or perceived motion as it is without having a whole bunch bouncing around. Not to mention when you're using socks, um, they, they, they just don't quite move like a greater Canada. A greater Canada is a big lumbering, think of it like a moose walking through the woods as opposed to a squirrel, like uh, a lesser would be like a squirrel or the ducks are the squirrels. They move quickly and there's a lot of movement in their bodies when they move. The, the big Canadas, they kind of lurch. They got big steps and, and it's, a, it's a slower motion. So the socks don't really represent that as well. So for that reason, I like to go very, very light on the socks, go almost exclusively, if not exclusively, silhouettes, um, and, and maybe throw a few black and whites in there as well to kind of mix in, not only amongst the lessers to make your mob look dark, but also uh, through those family groups and pairs way downwind, uh, way off to the side of you, just to kind of make them stand out, to give yourself a little bit darker footprint. You're gonna have a little bit more success uh, with those black and whites mixed in. Um, with the lessers, they do love the movement that the socks provide, uh, but the graders are more difficult to fool. So that's kind of why I lean towards uh, favoring the graders. You're already kind of pushing it with the graders by putting a big old mob of, of lessers there. Um, and, and you're again, hoping that they're gonna land on the outskirts of your decoys uh, or that main mob there or swinging over the top of you. Uh, the lessers don't tend to be as picky as the big ones. They don't need the socks. They don't need that extra movement. And if you're really concerned about movement and added realism, a flag goes a long, long way, whether it's just your typical handheld flag or if you stick one on a nice long pole uh, to be able to create some motion away from where you're hiding, that works really well too. Now, when it comes to spacing, uh, again, you know, we, we talked about this mob and then a bunch of family groups spread out to create the shape of your spread. In that mob, I treat it like I do typical lesser uh, setup. A lot of decoys fairly close together, about three to four, maybe five steps apart, but, but fairly close together with some clusters tighter and some clusters just a little bit looser, a couple open pockets in the middle to give those lessers a spot to filter into because they want right in the heart of the action, right in the middle of it. So um, nice and, and reasonably tight in there in those decoys amongst you, you know, 20, 30 yards on either side of you and, uh, and you know, five yards in front, five yards behind or something like that to get that little, little mob of lessers as they're kind of working their way through the field. And then when you start getting out into the greater Canada decoys, uh, that's when I go back to more typical greater Canada spacing. You, you, I try to think of it as lessers and graders in the same spot, and that's, that's all we're trying to mimic right there. So with the greater Canadas, we like to go minimum of three steps, more like five to seven steps between decoys, or maybe have a couple that are close together and then you know another decoy or two spread out. But these groups, like I said, two to a dozen-ish, and um, we wanna spread those groups apart from each other a long way. That's where our spacing really comes in handy and really starts to become noticeable, and that's the big difference when you're looking at graders and lessers on the field. So um, as you start spreading those groups out, and I like to have a minimum of 10 to 15 yards between them, preferably closer to 20 or 25 yards between each group. Um, that's not in that mob to just spread it out. It seems like a lot. You're gonna cover a lot of country and you're gonna have a lot of decoys well out of shooting range, but it's gonna create a much more realistic look. And when it comes down to it, all geese are trying to get where the food is. While the graders may not try to land right in the middle of it, they'll land on the edge and they'll come in and kind of assert their dominance that way, or just kind of 
pick off of the big uh, food pile, if you will, or the big concentration of food, they'll, they'll work off the edge of that as well and not in, get in there and fight the lessers, depending on the bird and, and how dominant a bird they might be. So um, that's kind of how I like to space things out. Uh, and, and really, that's, that's about it for this one. So just wanted to say thanks again, Brian, for submitting that question. Go ahead and make sure you send an email. You're going to send this email for your hat to info at divebombindustries.com. That's Asher. He's going to get you all sorted out with whatever hat you'd like, and he'll get it shipped off to you. And for anyone else out there who's got questions related to anything waterfowling, please send those to me, forest at divebombindustries.com. That's forest with two R's. Uh, and then go ahead and also like and subscribe this uh, to this series here and turn those alerts on down there so you don't miss on, out on any episodes in the future. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Field Packs with Forest.